Hello lovely viewers and welcome to Learn with Jeju. Today in this lesson we shall discuss the poem Death in the Dawn by Wally Soyika. I will give you the summary of this poem and try to analyze it as much as possible for your understanding. Kindly hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so that you are notified anytime I upload a new video. Death in the Dawn is an amazing poem that describes the cycle of human life. It describes the uncertainties that come with life and how sudden events can occur in man's all. The poem, Death in the Dawn, is set on a road to Lagos in Nigeria. This means that everything, every scene in the poem takes place on the road. On this road, two accidents occur as a traveler embarks on a journey at dawn. The first accident occurs when the traveler himself smashes a cork on his windscreen, while the second sees the traveler witness the death of his colleague human being in an automobile accident. Whereas the traveler felt somewhat unconcerned smashing the cockerel in what happens to be the first accident in the poem, he is left stunned at the sight of a dead fellow in a car crash, making him question the essence of human progress. Let's now delve into the poem properly, stanza by stanza. Let's try to analyze it and understand what indeed the poem is communicating. Before we proceed, I want to take you through the poem and read through it so that I can be able to give you a holistic picture of the poet's message. Traveler, you must set out at dawn and wipe your feet upon the dog nose wetness of earth. Let sunrise quench your lamps and watch faint brush prickling in the skylight. Cotton feet to break the early earthworm on the hole. Now shadows stretch with sap, not twilight's death and sad prostration. This soft kindling, soft receding breeds Raising joys and apprehensions, for a naked day, bedding hawks retract. Stoop to the mess and faceless strong to wake the silent market swift, mute procession on grey byways. On this counterpane, it was sudden winter at the death of dawn's lone trumpeter, cascades of white feather flakes, but it proved a futile right. Propitiation sped grimly on before, the right fought for joy, the left dread, and the mother prayed, child. May you never walk when the road waits famished. Traveller, you must set forth at dawn. I promise marvels of the holy hour, presages as the white cock's flapped perverse impalement, as who would dare the raffle wings of man's progression. But such another wraith, brother, silence in the startled hug of your invention, is this mock grimace, this close contortion, I. So, that's the poem. But you should understand that the title, Death in the Dawn, is a paradox. Almost everything in the poem is paradoxical, with words or, let's say, phenomena being just opposed with their opposites. So in the first stanza, the poet writes, Traveller, you must set out at dawn and wipe your feet upon the dog-nosed wetness of earth. In the first stanza, the persona addresses all readers. In fact, not just readers, but every human being as travellers who will have to begin their journey at dawn. Dawn is a symbol of a new beginning, of growth and of prosperity. And so when the persona refers to its readers as travelers, he actually refers to them as every other human being who must begin the cycle of life through birth as a journey with all the bliss and promise that comes along with giving birth to a child. Some of the bliss that comes along with being a child include wiping your feet upon the dog nose wetness of earth. Yes, as a child, you are taught by dawn the realities of life. They need to depend on nature for survival. Images in the first stanza depicts innocence of the traveler as a child, the simplicity and novelty of dawn, and mostly how unsophisticated it is at the beginning of one's life. Let sunrise quench your lamps and watch faint brush prickling in the skylight, cotton feet to break the early earthworm on the hole. Now shadows stretch with sap, not twilight's death and sad prostration. Now, the traveller who is the driver of an automobile can now turn off his headlights because the sun is rising. One could also understand the first line of the second stanza as an admonishment from a voice to the persona and to a group of people to switch off all forms of light, be it lanterns, torches, lamps and the like, because nature's light, which is the sun, has come to take over for the day. In the subsequent lines of the poem, the poet presents to us a description of the natural events of the morning that is, faint brush prickling in the skylight. This line describes the coloring of the sky by the sun's light as it emerges from dawn through the morning. It is clear from this point 
that dawn is being described as soft and fragile. Cotton feet to break the early earthworm on the hoe describes the farmers who are journeying their way at dawn to their farms through the bushes in order to cultivate food. This line reveals to the persona man's connection with nature. This is one of the things that one learns as he grows, that is, having the understanding that before one can provide food on the table, he or she would have to break an early earthworm with their hose first. Now, shadows stretch with sap, not twilight's death and sad prostration. These lines portray the sense of grief that the dawn gives as opposed to the powerlessness and declining nature of twilight. This soft kindling, soft receding breeds, raising joys and apprehensions for a naked day, bedding hawks retract, stoop to the mist in faceless strong to work their silent market swift, mute processions on grey byways. In the third stanza, we are introduced to the bitterness that comes along with waking up at dawn. As dawn grows into the naked day, some sort of confusion surfaces. Racing joys and apprehensions are felt by those who wake up. Some wake up with the expectation of happiness, others expectation of fear or suspicion of something bad. With the rapid increase of activities as the day comes alive, bedding hawks retract, and they stoop to the mist in the faceless strong. What does the persona mean by this? Remember, almost everything in this poem is portrayed in contrast to another thing. So therefore, it's quite surprising that as huge as hawks look like, they are easily overburdened, especially in the early hours of the day, that they retract or withdraw easily, that they stoop, or should I say yield easily in the midst of faceless people going about their day's work. All these descriptions of hawks implies a sense of conformity to a world of diverse people. Faceless strong in line 12 suggests a sense of anonymity. The idea of horse retracting therefore suggests the need to conform, to adapt, and to coexist in the midst of anonymous people. All these activities are supposed to ignite the vibrance in the market, to increase the hustle and bustle of the day, as possession of people appear to be mute before the day became naked. Take note that the nakedness of the day suggests some sense of vulnerability, that anything can happen as the day grows. So in stanza 4, something dramatic happens. What does the persona say? On this counterpane, it was sudden winter at the death of Dawn's lone trumpeter, cascades of white feather flakes, but it proved a futile right. Propitiation sped grimly on before. The summary of this entire stanza is that an accident has occurred. This is an accident between the driver of an automobile, that is the traveler, and Dawn's lone trumpeter. The poet describes the cock or cockerel as Dawn's lone trumpeter. In this accident, the cock dies and it flies out from the dark and smashes itself on the driver's windscreen. This unfortunate incident the poet describes occurs on a counterpane. What then is a counterpane? Literally, counter means opposite and pane means a piece of glass. Collectively, counterpane is used by the poet to mean a bed cover or bed sheet on which the cockerel dies. This bed sheet, that is the windscreen on which the cockerel smashes itself, is prickled, meaning it has a pointed surface that kills the cockerel. So on this counterpane, it was sudden winter at the death of Dawn's lone trumpeter. This line suggests that the death of the cockerel suddenly has transformed the exuberance of Dawn to winter. And you know in winter, there are snowfalls. The poet continues, Cascades of white feather flakes, but it proved a futile right. Now we are in winter, and the poet describes the death of the cock upon smashing itself on the traveler's windscreen as cascades of white feather flakes. That is to say that the cockerel's feathers are immediately transformed into snow flakes upon its death, implying a cover-up or secret burial of the cockerel. The driver, however, does not take the death of the cockerel as something he should worry about, it does not ring within his mind the need to be careful on the road. But it proved a futile right. Propitiation sped grimly on before. In the last lines of the stanza, we are made aware that the death of the cockerel is in fact a sacrifice in the propitiation right. Propitiation to mean a ritual of appeasing or pacifying any greater force by using the cockerel. This ritual is described both as significant and as futile by the poet. As we move on, you'll get to understand why the death of the cockerel is significant 
yet futile. The right foot for joy, the left dread, and the mother prayed, Child, may you never walk when the road waits famished. Stanza 5 commences with a voice from the past, possibly the traveler's mother, cautioning the son or the driver of the automobile about the dangers of the road. The right foot for joy, the left dread. This line gives an idea of the good things associated with everything right and bad with anything left. Metaphorically, right foot associated with joy might just imply the stepping on the accelerator on the right side of the driver's wheels, which moves the car forward. The forward movement of the car without any stoppage brings joy. The left foot, however, the symbol for the brakes of a car located at the left side of the accelerator, brings dread. It causes fear when applied. This line is a message to the driver of the car, the driver of his life, to take caution on the road, to find a balance between overspeeding, which brings joy, and underspeeding, which brings dread. In the next lines, the mother of the driver prays for his son never to travel when the road is hungry. It gives an impression that life is unpredictable, therefore the need for prayers to have an impact on our lives. Traveler, you must set forth at dawn. I promise marvels of the only hour, presages as the white cocks flap perverse impalement, as who would dare the raffle wings of man's progression. Remember in stanza 4, we said the rituals of the cockerel was both significant and futile. The significance of the cockerel's death comes with the interpretation from the voice in the past in stanza 6 about the cockerel's death. The voice promises the driver of the automobile marvels and wonders on the road, such as the cockerel's death when it happened to get in the way of the traveler. The voice continues by making readers understand that such will be the fate of anything or anybody that gets in the way of man's progression. Man's progression implies the technology built by man, such as the automobile. The futility of the cockerel's death is explained in the final stanza when the persona goes like, but such another wreath, brother, Silence in the silent startled hug of your invention. Is this mocked grimace, this close contortion I? In the final stanza, the prayer of the voice in stanza 5 manifests as the driver proceeds with his journey. Indeed, he witnesses another car accident, this time not between him and the cockerel, but between some other parties. This accident results in the death of a human being. Not only is the driver silenced and shocked at what he has seen, but he's also frightened as well. A run of emotions pushes the persona to question the supposed importance of human technology in our lives because as he stands, not only is the driver a killer, but he's also a target after witnessing his colleague human die in a similar accident as the one he had with the cockerel. Now we realize in the final stanza that the propitiation in stanza 4 proved to be futile. Futile in the sense that it was unsuccessful. It was done in vain with no real effect. In a bid to attract the blessings of the road by making sacrifices, the driver ends up witnessing the exact thing he was praying against. On this note, we draw the curtains of today's lesson to a close. If you enjoyed this lesson, kindly give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel as well.